Good morning, church family. It is good to be here today. And I would just like to add to the prayer that's already taken place and uh, ask you to bow your heads with me. Father God, I just want to add my prayer to what's already been said today, to the worship that we're having here. I just pray, Father, for your spirit to come down, that the words that I speak, Lord, may be your words. Be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't have the uh, roaming uh, mic, so I'm going to kind of be right in this area right in here. So this morning I would like to talk to you and probe a question about church identity. What is our mission and what does it look like and how are we supposed to function in this world today? I don't know about you, but there seems to be a lot of confusion about what it means to be a Christian today. The vibe that the church is giving off in the world, it's not one that I sometimes recognize. Sometimes we're not attracting people, but it seems like people are moving out. The church, you can agree with me, is not a place for performance, even though we have a stage, we have lights, we have mics. Church is not a place for performance. And we don't come here just once a week, and if this is all that it is, I think being a church community is more than that. The word church... Uh, that we use, church, uh, we get it from the German, and I'm not German, but I think it's Kirch. So we get it from there. Uh, that's, that's where the, you know, word. And in the German, it's referred to a building. It, it's, it's meant to be a building. It's describing a place of worship, but it's focusing on the building. Whoa, a little fast. Okay. Church in the Greek is made up of two words, uh, ecclesia, uh, which ek means to be out, and kaleo is to call. So that's what the word uh, church means in the Greek. So church means to call out. You and me are the called out. That's what we are, we are called out. So the question arises, we're called out, what are we called out from? My point with you today is going to be this. I believe that the church is an alternative community. It was always meant to be an alternative community to the culture. And it was set apart to be countercultural, to be different from the prevailing culture, to interact with the world differently from the norms of society. The word alternative uh, means relating to behavior that is considered unconventional and is often seen as a challenge to traditional norms. That's what alternative means. I think it was Webster's Dictionary. So different from the usual conventional, such as existing or functioning outside the establishment, the cultural, social norms, or economic system. That's what the word alternative means. And so the church as an alternative community forges a new path that is different than the conventional, different than what is normally considered how people should do life. How do we do life? Our pattern, our ethics, our directives, all are guided by our mission. Wouldn't you agree that that is what, being a Christian, we're all guided by the mission that was given to us by, by Jesus, our master. Jesus is our founder. He is the key. He is the center of Scripture. He is the center of the story, the narrative story of Scripture. Jesus is at the center. And the church, in its beginning, as it was launched, it was intended uh, to go in a general trajectory that was far different from the pattern of this world. Jesus came and established his kingdom. And when he established his kingdom, you know, he said words that might seem to be kind of harsh. But in James chapter 4, verse 4, he says, 
Friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So here we see this kind of dualism here about the world and the church. But the world here that is being described, the word the world, that's not the orb that we're talking about. But it's the system, the ethos, the principles that govern the pervading culture. If you were to take a minute and look at television and look at what um, it tells us about culture or social media or whatever it might be, you might get the impression that it's really all about me, myself, and I. The focus is really very self-centered. It's about the individual. The self is elevated above the community. And I believe, I believe we get a glimpse of this through Scripture, uh, of what it means to be called out. Um, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, um, the picture is painted of the world in trouble. Man has broken his relationship, vertical relationship with God. He has broken the horizontal relationship amongst each other. The world is destroyed. We see that then social groups begin to form. And you, you get all these things that are happening. Social bonds are broken. Um, you have sectarianism, tribalism. Things are separated. People are separated. And then in chapter 12, we get to chapter 12, and we find that in chapter 12, God has a plan. God has a solution. And this is where the story of narrative just changes and it slows down and we talk about Abraham. God calls out Abraham to come out. God's solution to the prevailing evil in the world was to call out Abraham. And he called him out of his familial surroundings, from his settings, from his regional gods that he had, from his clan, from his comfort. He was called out from his cultural surroundings and he was promised land and descendants. And God's plan for Abraham was a foreshadow of his church to call out. He called him out, and he calls us out. In that call to Abraham, we see in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram was called out of his land to a place that God was going to show him. He was 75 years old and Abram believed and obeyed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness, right? And he obeyed and he went. And notice that it says that all the families of the earth would be blessed. All of the families. So today, church family, we as the church, as the called out ones, we are recipients of the blessing of Abram. We are still receiving that same blessing that Abram received. We are called out to be a blessing. Abram was called out of the land. And he was also, if you remember, um, he was also told to walk the land that God showed him, right? And he walked it from the east to the west, the north to the south. He walked the land. In that time, walking the land meant you were taking possession of it. But this, you were claiming it as your own. And I think this was God's way of saying to the usurper, to Satan, the accuser, this is now my representative. He is claiming this land. And as we know, as we look through the narrative of Scripture, we see that God's plan to Abraham was then traced into the promise of a son, Isaac, and then the blessing God passed down to Jacob, and then Joseph, and to the children of Israel. And we see that. And we see that Israel was also called out. 
Israel was called out. God used Moses. And God said, Moses, right? And he called him out. And the children of Israel were taken out of Egypt captivity and bondage to call them out of the culture of Egypt, to call them out of the, their gods, of the things that they would do, how they did life. And they were called out to be different. He set them free, and he took away their burdens and their oppression, and he gave them his laws and his precepts. In Exodus chapter 19, right before he gives the law, verses 5 through 6, it says, Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possessions among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Israel was to be a kingdom of priests. Now, what does a priest do? Priest mediates, right? So if you have a kingdom of priests, it wasn't one priest, but a kingdom of priests, they were all to mediate. What were they to mediate? They were to mediate to show maybe a picture of God to those who did not know God, to be an in-between, to show how to do life differently. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5 through 8, this is Moses, Moses is speaking. And he said, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the, the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land that you are to possess. Therefore, he says, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the, of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near them, so near to it, as the Lord our God is near to us? And for what reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statues and righteous judgments as are in his, this law which I have set before you this day? God's law which we say is a representation of his character, love for God and love for neighbor. This law is a, re, re, a representation of God's character. And all the nations would look at a contrast. They would look at the way they did life, and they would look at the way the Israelites were looking, doing life. And they were going to say, wow, God is so near those people. They have these laws, and these laws, they're flourishing. And I want to know about them. They became attractive. They were supposed to be attractive. They were never meant to be exclusive, only to be just to them. They were to invite the foreigner in. Right? God is good. And if we obey his principles, we flourish. We thrive. We become a light on a hill where other people are attracted. Not because we are good, but because God's ways are good. Because He is good. Israel was called out of the world to represent principles of God's kingdom in contrast to the prevailing world system. This was love. It was an experiment in contrast they were to show love. They were to flourish. Israel was called out to demonstrate what life looks like when it is lived in covenantal love to God and to their neighbors. Israel was an alternative community with unique identity grounded in God's law. Alternative identities, alternative music, maybe many of you who were grew up as maybe I did in the 80s as a you know, young uh, college-age person. I was into alternative music back then. And there was a phenomenon that took place in Seattle 
I don't know, I know pastors near that area, so he probably would relate to it. There was, there was a phenomena that took place. It was the grunge music theme. And it was an alternative community. It was an alternative group. And you might be wondering, where is George going with this? But just bear with me for a little bit. This is this alternative community it was made up of groups like Nirvana, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, many others. And one of the, uh, he was called the voice of a generation, Kurt Cobain. Um, he was part of this grunge scene. And the scene was, they were anti-establishment. They looked at the, at the music scene, and there was this huge corporate uh, you know, conglomerates that were controlling the music scene, and they considered it a sellout. Um, these young people began to notice that music scene was just a large commercialized enterprise. It was all about making money. They were reaching, um, they were reacting with, to what they saw and perceived as a sellout. These groups didn't want to have anything to do with the music industry. They had a set of beliefs that they had something to say. And they just wanted to say it. And they were anti-mainstream. They were kind of a reaction against the glam uh, rock that was happening. I don't know if you remember, but men you know, had the hair and had the, the dress. They, they were dressed a certain way. Um, and they were reacting to that. And so they signed uh, a label, uh, Kurt Cobain, which was called Sub Pop. Uh, and that label means under what is popular. That was the name of the label. They didn't want to be popular. They were not about making money. And they were anti-mainstream, and they offered a scathing rebuke on capitalism as it had encroached on all art forms for the almighty dollar. That was their reaction. And they were against the music establishment. They were... And they said, we're never going to sell out. They made promises to each other. And they said, you cannot buy us. They made pledges. After concerts, Kurt Cobain would get up and say, do not buy my albums. Do not buy the records. Isn't that kind of strange? They were doing it because they believed in something. They were passionate. They had revolution running through their veins. They did it because that's what they wanted to do. They believed in something very strongly. So their hair was messy on purpose. Their clothes were frumpy, mismatched, on purpose. Their shoes were torn and tattered, on purpose. We were against the establishment, the culture around us, the consumerism around us. They were against that. But you know, then something interesting happened. Macy's and other department stores said, hey, let's make clothes like that and let's sell them. And we're going to call it grunge fashion. And pretty soon, people were buying this. Many people were buying. They wanted to associate with the grunge look. They wanted to be just like them. But there's a problem. Those people did not have revolution in their minds. Right? They, they were consumers. They wanted to consume it. They were pretenders. They wanted to look like it. Right? So the grunge fashion was started and people made a lot of money. They made a lot of money. They still make money. And they began to cash in on the movement and of something that the movement was never intended. It actually was the opposite. Now, there are part, there's a pattern to movements, and maybe you might recognize this. But when you have a movement with a mission, right, there's passion there, there's fervor, but then it becomes popular. It becomes a trend. And then it becomes a commodified product to be sold. 
In the end, it loses its essence. Pretty soon you had imposters looking the part, but they were only in it for the money. You had performers, but they were only in it for the money. They didn't have revolution in their veins. They were in it only to make money for the almighty dollar. So pretty soon, a lot of the grungers started to leave. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. Many of them were torn by this popularity. They didn't know how to handle it. They turned to drugs and addiction, and some of them died. Kurt Cobain died at 27 years old. He took his life. Those imposters, they did not have the spirit of the thing. The movement, the movement became corrupted. Did this remind you of any other movements? Hmm? Street cred. What is street cred? The ex, you know, when I looked at the dictionary, it said to ex, the acceptance and response of people who live in poor city neighborhoods. Street cred. It's a word, it's kind of a slang, right? Um, but I would suggest to you this morning that having some moral authority, street cred could be something that, uh, to have credibility, that you are true to, to your passions, that you have integrity in your life that your life lines up with what you profess, that's street cred. So if the movement begins to lose its original fervor, you can lose street cred. When people begin to see the shell of a thing, but it doesn't measure up to the substance of the thing, people lose interest. One of the current statistics throughout Christian gym in the Western world is that churches aren't growing. There is a decline. The church is aging. People are living, leaving. Specifically, a lot of young people are leaving, people that are college age. They're leaving the church. Churches in, in general. They're leaving. There's something that's missing there. Maybe they're seeing something. And they're leaving. Churches are becoming, and I'm an architect, I know, churches are being converted to marketplaces, uh, being converted to all sorts of things, restaurants. They're not being used for their intended purpose. This is a travesty. So what's going on? We get to the point of looking at Israel. Just take, a step, just take a step back. They were to be the light to the nations. They were not meant to be reclusive and exclusive, but were meant to be a blessing. Israel was meant to be sharing the righteous judgments, showing God's love and His mercy to a broken world. Yet something goes terribly wrong. So by the time that Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus comes and He looks, and the commercialized religion of the day, the Jews, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, right? they were all being paid by the Romans, by the way. They were receiving money from the Romans. They were popular. These positions were set up by them. They were part of the system. Jesus comes and he doesn't recognize that system. He calls them, they were hypocrites. They were supposed to be something different. But when he comes, he doesn't recognize them. And so when we look at the Beatitudes, Jesus uh, in, the, in, the, in the Beatitudes, when he starts uh, talking about his kingdom, many examples he says, you have heard, but I say. You have heard from those of old, but I say, he had to re-script the mission. Jesus had to re-script that mission. So let's look at that mission. And if you get a chance, 
uh, tonight or today, go back and read all of Luke chapter 4. Um, originally, the people from his town thought he's great. He's one of us. The Messiah is coming from our place. But then after he says some things, do you remember they took him to an edge of a cliff and wanted to push him off? They didn't want to have anything to do with him. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So Jesus took the book, he closed it, and in verse 21, he said to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was called out. And he said, I'm here to preach the good news. The happy tidings. And notice, it's to the poor. He is sent to heal the brokenhearted the depressed, the downtrodden, to give freedom to whatever holds you captive. Heal the blind, not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally. To free the oppressed, the marginalized in society. To say, hey, the acceptable year of the Lord is, hey, God is for you. God is good, and He's for you. He's not against you. I like this Jesus. How about you? Jesus was accused of being a friend of sinners. To which I say, Amen. His plan for the early apostolic church and His call for you and me is similar today. We, as a church, we are the called out ones. We are called out. And we're called out to be alternative, to be different than the world. God's plan is to have an alternative community. And they did. If you read the book of Acts, wow. They turned the world upside down. If you read in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, it says, But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Are we turning the world upside down today? The, ap the apostolic church fulfilled Christ's mission by spreading the good news, by spreading the gospel. And they were an alternative community to the prevailing Roman system the believers were accused of being rebels, being revolutionary, turning the world upside down. They were going against the grain. How did they do it? What, what led them to do this? Because I feel like we need this now. Whatever they had, we need it. Don't you think? We need that. We need that revolution flowing in our veins. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, this is Peter now. And, and, he, and, and, and basically, he, Peter just got finished telling these people what they've done and who Jesus was. And they're like, tell us, what shall we do? A question we're asking today. And he says, then Peter said to them, repent. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The word repent is metanoia, means to do a 180, to go opposite of the way that you were going, to change your thinking, to change your frame of mind. To be baptized from the baptismo is to be immersed. So in other words, 
It's a reenactment of Jesus' narrative of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And we are identifying with that. That becomes our identity. We are identifying with Jesus. And it says that we are to do this in the name of Jesus because Jesus' character is his way of doing life to what Jesus did. So he's our example. Here's the one that we're supposed to follow. You're not supposed to follow me or the pastor or anyone else. You're supposed to follow Jesus. And he says you will receive the Holy Spirit. And we receive the Holy Spirit. We are meant to be inhabited by the third person of the Godhead. We're not just ourselves, but we are meant to be inhabited. We are temples. We are the building of God. We are a shell for the indwelling of the Spirit. And perhaps maybe this is what we're missing. But there is hope. In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the Holy Spirit's role is to reveal God's love in our hearts. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's revealing God's love to us in our hearts. The Holy Spirit arouses a sense of God's love for us so that we relate to others as we perceive God relating to us. The Holy Spirit is given to maximize God's love in us, taking up all the space, all our rational mind, all our emotional space, filling every nook and cranny. In 2 Corinthians, um, I think Paul says, in uh, 3.17, he says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we are set free, not to sin, but He set us free so that we could love more fully. We're set free from the things that would destroy us and make us less human. That's what Jesus has done for us. The church, I would suggest to you this morning, is a group of believers that think and feel and possess re- and process reality differently because they have identified with God and His love. And they decide to do life radically different than the world around them. Christianity began with revolution at its core. It had a belief system and a ministry. It called to follow Jesus and His teachings. To live out His love in the world. God is love. And because we believe it, because we received it, we then love one another here. But we're not just to keep it here, we are to also love others that are not here, not within our walls. Didn't Jesus say in John 13, 35, By this will all know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Sin can be defined as the triumph of the individual interests over the community interests. The elevation of me over us. It is self-centered over other-centeredness. Uh, we had a, a, a presentation coach come to our office um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and um, he specializes in communication and how to present to win uh, jobs. So as many of you know, I'm an architect, and so sometimes we, to be selected, uh, we're interviewing and competing against other architectural firms. And so he came over to train our leadership. We had a group of 12 to uh, train us and to be more effective at making presentations and communi- communicating with our clients. And one of the interesting things that he said to us was, you know, when you go to, uh, to an interview, um, the data shows that the people that are interviewing your clients, your developers or cities, what they're really looking for is 
Not are you competent. If, if you were invited, you're, you're competent already. They know that. You're invited. You're there because they know you can do the job. But to make the selection of why do they want to work with you? Why, 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 do, why do you choose one over the other? And he said, and it just kind of blew me away, he's like, they want to know whether they like you. That's really it. They want to know, do they, do they like you? Can they work with you for two, three, four years? Are you a likable person? And, you know, that got, kind of got me thinking a little bit about what if, you know, we've seen this all wrong in terms of witnessing and sharing Jesus with others, right? They're looking at us and, you know, and do they like us? Do we like them? You know, maybe that's kind of where we're missing some connections. Maybe, you know, the church is losing some moral authority because maybe we're, they're not seeing love. They're not seeing Jesus in us. And so the world is saying, I don't know about them. I like Jesus, but I don't know about them. And so I, I find that there's a need in me. I, I need to be more like Jesus. And I'll stand here before you and say, I, I, I'm not there. I, I, I know that I am not there. I'm not representing my Savior as I should. A uh, Swiss theologian uh, by the name of Hans Urs von Balthasar, he, uh, he said this, Love alone is credible. Nothing else can be believed. Nothing else should be believed. Let that sink in for a minute. Love alone is credible. Nothing else can be believed. Nothing else should be believed. In regards to Christianity in the world, you can't expect people to join a movement through doctrine and theology only. You can't argue them into the church. They want to know, do you like me? Are you for me? Or are you for yourself? Are you for me and for others? Are you self-centered or other-centered? Nothing but love can be believed. Love is the only believable thing. That is the fundamental question that people will ask, that people see in us. In looking at Christianity today, there are many systems. People will go through things. And many do it out of habit. Many do it for various reasons, comfort. Um, but there's, there's certain credibility that can come when we look at the disadvantaged. Anything different than helping others or looking at others and assisting our fellow man, I think we would be sus suspect of. People will say, well, do I really want to listen to them? If our life is not living in, a, in alignment with what Jesus has taught, with what the Word says, in a world today that is filled of hatred and political strife and, and us and them, we see it. We see it. Um, Ty Gibson uh, has done a series where some of this material comes from. This series uh, was entitled The Alternative Community. It's a 13-part series. And uh, if any of you have a chance, I would highly recommend it uh, to go through it. But he said something very interesting, and I'm quoting him here, and he says, In a world of hate, love is the most revolutionary thing we can do right now. And that resonated with me. And maybe we need to take a step back and we need to reread our script. We need to go back and let's read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then let's add some of the letters from Paul. As you know, we've started study groups. You know, we're trying to study a Bible study group every week to meet here after church. Pastor just got done preaching a series on our Bibles. We need to get into God's Word. We need to be reminded of what is our 
mission? What, is, what, what, what are we about? What does it look like to be a Christian today? Pew Research asked a question. Now, this question is from five years ago, okay? But it said, should we help people who have been forced to leave their countries due to horrifying circumstances? And, and this is not a political uh, question that I raise. This is, just, this is just the data, okay? I'm just presenting to you the data. The question is, people that have been forced to leave their countries, should we help them, right? I don't know if you can see this because I think the type is really small, but 64% of non-believers, non-believers, these are atheists or people that, you know, when they fill out the form says, we're none, yeah, we're, we don't believe, we're, we're none. We don't want to be associated with anybody. 64% of them, percent of them said, yes, we should help them. Interesting, right? So they asked the same question to white, evangel white evangelicals. 25% of those said, yes, we should help them. Now, that for me is a little painful. But that is the world that we are living in today. 2 Timothy, Paul giving admonition to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. He says, but know this, that in the last days, so, so that's, are we living in the last days? We, we say we, we are, right? We believe it? I think so. Listen to this. He says, but you know that in the last days, perilous times will come. Paul, what kind of what, uh, uh, perilous times are coming? Are earthquakes and, and disasters? Is that, is that what's coming? He says, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Paul is addressing here the church. These are believers. These are those who profess godliness. This is the church he's talking about. Paul's warning to Timothy. It's not about terrible events. Paul is describing in these last days terrible people. That's what he's describing. Terrible people. I don't know if any of you have seen the bumper sticker that some people have that says, Jesus called, he wants his religion back. I don't know if you've ever seen that bumper sticker. The church is supposed to be a place where flourishment takes place. To represent Jesus and demonstrate God's love to those who are oppressed, to those that are burdened, captives, to offer some respite, some non-judgmentalism to those who are under tyranny, who are suffering from strife, from exploitation. Those are the people that are in the margins, the ones that are depressed. Those are the ones we are to proclaim the good news, the gospel, and then gospel says, God loves you, and he proved it on Calvary. And because he loves us, we love you too. This new identity we receive the moment we are baptized. So our story, our immersion, if we are to be like the early church, our lives should be immersed into Jesus' life, into his story. We become accepted into Jesus' story, and we reject Adam's story. We accept Jesus' story. That's who we are baptized under. So I have a dream this morning for our church, for Scottsdale Thunderbird Church, for this church here, also for the global church, but this church specifically. 
to be called out, we should be, and, I'm, and by the way, I'm not saying that we're not, because I think we are a welcoming church, but we need to be, expand our horizons. We need to be thinking differently. We should be a warm place that's an inclusive place for community. Inviting others to come in. It doesn't matter that they don't look like us. It doesn't matter that they don't dress like us. We should be a welcoming place. A place where everyone practices love and is encouraged. A place where we serve one another. Where we lift each other up. Where we lift each other up because we all fall down. We all need prayers. We all need help. We are all in it together as a community. We learn and grow by reading the word together. So I would encourage you as maybe you'll be receiving invitations to join a Bible study group. That you will say yes to it. And that you will get into the word. We are here to lift each other up. So will you join me this morning and be alternative?